Welcome back, folks. This is part two of American Heroes, the Montana Freemen. People have asked, well, why do you consider them heroes? It should be obvious. These were men who stood up to tyranny and corruption and would have none of it. They did everything they could in a peaceful manner to confront the criminals in their local and state governments. They put themselves on the line at great risk to run their own local township government in the way it was prescribed to be run by law. They took great pains to learn how to do things according to the law. And when they started achieving success, the criminals in positions of power ratcheted up the stakes and just like the mafia going after its competition, they brought out all the guns and the might and the power of government with unlimited funding to put them down. No trick was too dirty and no act was too unlawful. Tyrants always feel that the end justifies the means. In this episode, I've broken the conversation down into segments, which will reflect some of the different subject matter. We spent uh, several hours on the phone and I've whittled it down uh, to eliminate some of the uh, common knowledge such as what is lawful money, traveling without a license, many of these issues uh, most of us are, are already familiar with. So uh, you'll see different segments come and go perhaps with an abrupt change and uh, so if we change subjects suddenly without much notice just be alert for those change-ups, alright? So let's get started. Yeah, this is Daniel Peterson. Uh, I'm one of the purported Montana Freeman. I spent about 20 years in prison. Uh, I'm now living in Billings, Montana and still active in trying to get justice. I think, Mark, the only way that they're going to get it done is when they admit that the United States is in existence in name only and it is not under constitutional law, it's under corporate law. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as they admit that, we will we will get back. You know, we'll get back to republic. We're in a democracy right now, and, and when you do a comparison on the two, there's no comparison. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the founding fathers, uh, you know very well, abhorred democracy as the worst form of government possible. You better off. You better off to live under a, a beneficent king. That's right. Yeah. yeah. have the teachings of Leroy and uh, that's basically what it was what I my part of the teaching was was the laws that I had found and one of them uh, is called the Federal Mandates Act it was passed by the Montana state legislatures uh, in 1985 about uh, six months before Leroy and I got kidnapped or maybe it was a year before, but it's called the Federal Mandates Act. I feel the Federal Mandates Act is one of the most important deals, and uh, it's saying that uh, the federal government has intruded in on uh, the rights of, of the people, and we know that. And uh, we knew it at the time, but we didn't know about the Federal Mandates Act being uh, passed by the state legislatures, these guys, they just, they went goofy over, over this. So what was the crux of the Federal Mandate Act? What was the well, intent? I'm trying to find it here. Uh, what it is, it says that the federal government has intruded on state's jurisdiction, and they're just trampling it. It's quite a law. We got convicted uh, through the news media in, in uh, um, Pat McGuire, one of my co-defendants, he uh, got an affidavit from a guy by the name of James Coates out of Red Lodge who was the grand jury foreman for, for the first trial that they had on us. And uh, he said uh, the Montana Freeman would have never got a fair trial because there was outside influence. And, 
he, he put it in affidavit form, filed it with the court, and the court never addressed it. Now that's justice. Yeah. According to them. Well, more like political agenda, huh? Of course. Under, is, under cover of justice, the word, the label justice. Right, I think last time that I talked to you, I talked about the Administrative Procedure Act and the Federal uh, Code of Federal Regulations, how everything has to be published in them or it's not a positive law. There's a case, it's called Hotch, H-O-T-C-H versus the United States. And this was done March 22nd of 1954. And it says, uh, this is under the overview part, it says under the uh, Administrative Procedure Act in Title V of the United States Code, Section 1001 and, and others, uh, and the Federal Register Act, which is in Title 44 of the United States Code, at Section 305, publication was a prerequisite to the issuance of a regulation. Not actual notice was a substitute for the filing of duplicate originals, but was not a substitute for publication. APA and FRA require publication, irrespective of actual notice as a record to the issuance of a regulation making certain acts criminal. So if they're not published, and then it says this is the outcome of that case or in the opinion, it said court denies appellate petition filing appellate could not be convicted under the regulation at issue because regulation did not have force of law since it was not published in the Federal Register as required by the Administrative Procedure Act and the Federal Register Act. This is then presented to the court, and they're still just overlooking it or ignoring it. Yeah, so if it's not published, it's not law, he's saying. It. So That's it's, right. Yeah. And then under the section that has government courts and common law, it says under the American system of law, no act is punishable as a crime unless it is specifically condemned by the common law or by a statutory enactment of the legislature. Case is closed, you know. All of this stuff that I've got, uh, or all of the charges that was brought against us, is not published in the Code of Federal Re Regulations through the Administrative Procedure Act. So, you know, I've tried to get uh, attorneys to take and readdress this, but Mark, they're not going to go against each other. No, no, they don't. Uh, because, and see, this is why I feel that Donald Trump, he asked all of the prosecuting United States attorneys to step down. And uh, there's a reason for it. They're not honest. Right. No. Judges are part of the system. Yeah, and the dishonesty is not just on an individual per individual basis. It's it's systemic. Yeah. From one end to the other, and uh, we see we see it time and time again. And uh, I just did a video on fraud of the U.S. judiciary based on this change in the oath that they made that the the Lufkin action at law brought out. And uh, they're not bound. They're not bound to the Constitution, and, and it's 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 in the law. One of the documents that I've got, you know, they put me when they gave me the second charge. They put me in Stillwater, Minnesota, in a state prison, uh, waiting to be tried in a federal court, and assigned me a a. Um, state prison number and I have never been convicted of anything and uh, I've got a letter here from this was sent back to me and her name was Mary McComb she was the associate warden administrator administrator and this letter was given to me on uh, July 13th of 2009 and um, 
she was returning all of my mail because of the fact the way I was addressing this. And it says, uh, the department's main concern is that inmates holding the sovereign ideology do not engage in harassing conduct toward government employees. This includes, one, filing fraudulent liens against our staff or other government employees, and or, two, sending harassing uh, quasi-legal documents to staff with demand for money. These active activities are not allowed. Then it says the department has adopted a proactive approach to inmates who might wish to use the UCC to intimidate and harass staff. The following rules have been developed. Number one, inmates may not possess any UCC-1 forms, whether blank or complete. Number two, inmates may not possess any materials that activate or describe uh, how to use the UCC to personally attack government officials. Such materials are contraband and subject to confiscation and destruction. Number three, offenders may not use symbols, extra identification, Latin phrases, UCC citations, miscellaneous punctuation, or other sovereign identifiers <laughs> in conjunction with their names. Wow. Kites, correspondence, and other documents may contain only the offender's commitment name of legal name or documented by a court order or OID. Uh, the mail room will not possess any, process any incoming or outgoing mail with these identifiers. Staff will not respond to any kites or other uh, correspondence received from inmates with these identifiers. Such documents may be destroyed or retained as evidence. Evidence of what? Freedom of speech? Yeah, yeah. U use of the law? Right. Reference and to the law, UCC? The kicker in here, Mark, is the fact that they say Latin phrases. Uh huh. Where did our where did our uh, uh, corporation government come from? Well, sure, Latin Latin is the foundation of of the principles, <laughs> the maxims of law. Bovi and they're saying that I can, I can't use it. Yeah, Bovier's dictionary is full of Latin phrases uh, for legal references. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, every time I was trying to correspond with anybody, uh, she would send this stuff back. I've, I've got all of this stuff stapled together, and uh, uh, what I have done, I have taken it in, and I was requesting why they wouldn't uh, process my mail. And see, they had me as he was my counselor and case manager while I was incarcerated in this this terrorist unit of the, of Minnesota State. And his name is uh, Steve Ayers. He, he was the captain. And every time he had come and talked to me, I, I'd show him the law. And he keeps saying, well, I'm not a lawyer. I said, well, you by damn, you, know, you better go talk to the lawyer. This here is, it's important. But see, these guys keep Passing it off, passing it off, passing it off. Just like we had ran into here in Montana. The reason we had to establish Justice Township, we had to uh, try and follow the Montana Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that we're about ready to celebrate here in the next few days, you know? Yeah. We don't have any independence or isn't any. No, the whole holiday is a joke now. Yeah, it's, it's, a hit. it's just a commercial activity to sell fireworks and, and alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Well, um, let's drill down a little bit on the, uh, the classes that were going on. We touched on that a little bit last time. Like I said, I've got uh, a six-hour recording of Leroy, and uh, that'll break it down in detail. But could you just give us uh, kind of an overview of what, what the classes were about? Well, basically what it was was just uh, we were challenging all of these public pretenders, uh, and uh, that includes judges, prosecutors, 
sheriffs, everybody, <clears throat> what their duty and obligation was, and what they had to have to, the credentials that they had to possess in order to, to activate what they were trying to do. You know, whenever we had asked a sheriff or anybody, we didn't know who they were, a good majority of them, but, you know, they had a suit on, big deal. There's all kinds of imposters, and they're out there impersonating, and you hear about it all the time. You know, we just didn't dream it up. It, it's happening all the time. And uh, when we were trying to instruct the people, whenever you get pulled over, just don't cow down to them. Stand up and ask them for their oath and their bond. It's, it's mandatory. Uh, all right. It, 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 and there was a reason for it, you know, that's what I used to tell them whenever they dragged me in. I, you know, excuse me, I don't know who you are. I've never been formally introduced. Would you please provide your credentials? And they would blow up and, you know, and I, I tried to do it in a professional way, but they don't like that. No, they don't like so being they challenged. They start using profanity and everything on them. They understand that. <laughs> <laughs> that's... But as far as their IQ will let them go, a lot of them. Yeah. It's, uh, so you were teaching uh, teaching people what the limits of authority and legal responsibilities for performance and duties of public officials, so that people could uh, could understand, you know, what, where to draw the line. And then we were trying to connect that too with uh, with the Bible. One of my co-defendants. Uh, he, he was out of Canada, Dale Jacoby. Anyway, he was the one that, that kind of connected uh, what Leroy was showing along with the Bible. That's where all of our government came from to begin with. Either that or uh, the Bible is a lie because it, my understanding is that uh, God created everything and, and I, I really hung my hat on Galatians 5, 1 where it says, God gave us freedom, so don't yoke yourself with people in bondage. Yeah. And I, I, I feel that that's a base for everybody to get started. We hear it day in and day out, and it just didn't start after Montana Freeman came along. It was happening before. Uh, these people were pro-trained to be something that they weren't. And a, a little sheriff that was... A, he was out playing Montana Highway Patrol, and he would collect fines for and stick them in his pocket, and he'd never turn them into the justice peace, you know? Stuff like that, and somebody's got to eventually say enough's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're in this mess because we've allowed it to happen, and people have gotten uh, basically lazy and ignorant. People are more diligent and aware of the law and what the duties and functions of our public officials are and are not, then uh, I think we'd all be in much better position to to keep them in their respective boxes and operating lawfully. But uh, they don't. They don't get any resistance, and so they just do whatever they want to do, in mo many cases, far outside their scope of authority, and that's the problem we have, right? Well, and the thing of it is, is Montana Freeman, we weren't looking for any sympathy. We just felt that it was time that somebody stood up. And it was, we were a group of men with like minds and we're God-fearing people. It tells us that we're, we're supposed to be vigilant and look out for these people that, that uh, snuck in on us. In the book of Jude, it, it, it's only a page and a half long, and it tells you exactly what's going on, you know, right before Revelations. And, and when, when I even start quoting, quoting this to any of the officials now or in previous times, they keep saying, where did you get that stuff? Well, I got it out of a copyrighted book called The Holy Bible. You know, they don't even want to hear that. No. They don't know the Bible. They don't know their own law. They're just uh, out lost in space this somewhere. Is my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, collecting my paycheck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's sad. The 
these guys are slapping us around and stealing taxes and everything like that, and the bankers are, well, you know, and it's just a repeat of history, and this just didn't start, it's been going on and on and on, and, and uh, I was sick and tired of it, and I ran into some men, that, some other men that were sick and tired of it, and, but then they classified us as Montana Freeman, and, you know, then, because I, I really got into the book, you know, and, and uh, I looked up, uh, it says Waffle Man. And Waffle Man is a Freeman. And I said, well, that's good enough for me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and here the Billings Gazette had um, published it all over. They think they're a Freeman. Well, okay. Nothing wrong with that, yeah. And, uh, here the thing of it is, is we have these journalists and whatnot that they think they, they can they do a play on words and I ignored I went along with it too, you know, but when you start it's just like the word gay. I used to think that was for people that was happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, talking about the media twisting, you know, they want they want to convey the idea that oh, a, a free man is is somebody who thinks he's above the law and they can do whatever they want. When you just basically told just the opposite, a free man is a lawful man. Right. Just the opposite of what the media tried to portray. And see, it's just like this Mary McComb back in, in Minnesota when they had me there. Uh, she was portraying that to be a sovereign and, and uh, you couldn't be that. You couldn't do all of these little little things. And see, I already had my name copyrighted and on file with the Secretary of State in Minnesota. I tried to introduce that to that woman and show her, hey, look, Secretary of State has it on file. Now, if you've got an issue, let's take, let's take it to court. But they didn't want to hear that. They, you know, uh, anytime you back them into a corner, they, they just, well, they, they rely on somebody else. And pretty quick, you feel like you're a lone wolf and you're, you're fighting a pack of wolves. You know, one thing that I learned in court is that the attorneys, they don't know the law. Uh, they, they are so used to working procedure. That's what they do. They have procedures that they work with their fellow attorneys on the opposite side, at the other, sitting at the other table. And uh, uh, no matter who they represent, they're working in concert with the other attorney to go through these procedures and when someone like you or I or anybody who knows the law enters into their venue and is able to show them up for their lack of knowledge of what they're supposed to know uh, oh boy they get uh, they get pretty violent I was going to say it's kind of fun to watch them uh, blow steam out of their ears and turn all red in the face and t turn around in circles they don't know what to do <laughs> That's everything that I've done, and uh, I was prepared for all of this. I was told what was going to happen, and uh, the court-appointed attorney here in Billings, uh, I asked him, his name is Kelly J. Barnes. I asked him, I said, can I see your grade point average of what you got when you graduated from uh, <laughs> college for this profession? And he got totally, oh, he went ballistic. <laughs> That's and, pretty funny. <laughs> well, the thing of it was, you know, I don't know if he was qualified or not. Yeah. But it, doesn't it say in the Constitution that you have right of effective assistance of counsel? Absolutely. I think that's what I read anyway. Uh -huh. And, you know, if, if, he, if he doesn't know anything, then is he effective? Their job really is just to kind of be the conductor and steer you into the corral under the guise of defending your rights. Well, and not only that, they've got to keep the ship afloat because just a few guys out here, we have really done it to them. Uh, and uh, the reason we had done it was through exposure and asking the pertinent question. The biggest thing is, can I see your delegation of authority? I don't know who you are. It's like the county attorneys and whatnot. We knew most of them, but 
uh, still at the same time when you go check the county clerk and recorder's office and ask for their oath of office and their bond, they couldn't produce it. And it says that it's supposed to be on file in, as a public record. Well, where's the public record kept? It's kept in the county clerk and recorder's office and the secretary of state's office. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I'm not afraid to go ask these people for it. I, I did it up in my county, and, and uh, I was looking for the county commissioner's open bonds and the sheriff and the county clerk and recorder. I, I went to high school with her, and she couldn't find it. And so then, a day or two later, then she stopped my wife at the post office and says, tell Danny to come on down. We've got the oath of office for the sheriff. I go down there and they just made it. They wasn't even, they were stupid enough that they never even backdated her or anything. Oh my gosh. Everything that he'd done up to then was non-void. Oh my you gosh. Know, and I'm supposed to be stupid and sit there and let this go on? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, like I said, they're used to doing things their own way. Nobody ever holds them accountable. You come in asking questions, and they go, "Oh, yeah, yeah." Three years later, after he's been in office, we maybe we better do this. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the liens. You guys started studying the uh, Uniform Commercial Code, Banker's Law, uh, everything else, and uh, started uncovering all the fraud that was going on and uh, violations of uh, uh, duty and obligations by public officials. And I guess that led you into uh, looking for ways of enforcement. You had these uh, you had these uh, warrants out, wanted posters posted for some of the uh, public criminals. Tell us about how the liens all came about. Well, the liens was because of the fact that they wouldn't produce their credentials. And a lien is a claim. When you take and look up the word claim in Black's Law and lien in Black's Law, they're synonymous. All right, so we was putting a claim against them. They said they were liens, all right? Call it whatever you want. Because, you know, when you look up the definition of, of lien and, and of claim, it says they're, they're equal. Okay, so whenever you put a claim against somebody, then if they want to call it a lien, go ahead and call it a lien. But the thing that was really nice about all of this was in the bank officer's handbook, it says, and this was a copyrighted book that was, uh, I think one of the author's name was Schroeder or something like that. But anyway, he says uh, that any time that you have a claim against somebody, it becomes an accounts receivable. And accounts receivable are an asset at a bank. Well, okay. So uh, after you do the study in this, and they're coming right out of their book, and they didn't ever expect anybody to ever see that book, but there was an attorney up in Louisville, Montana, by the name of Tim O'Hare. We called him the snake. He gave the bank out his handbook to a fellow who is deceased now by the name of Ron Fulbright. And Ron Fulbright then got it to Leroy Schweitzer, and Leroy broke the code. And that's how this all came about, was these clean, these lanes and, and claims and whatnot, it's a substitute for money if they don't produce their credentials, then they're guilty of fraud. So what do you do? You take everything away from them, right? That's sure. They did that. You can't get justice in the courts, so you go commercial. Well, see, that, that's what they do. They, they take these uh, claims that they put against us, and they put a bond on them, and, and they're out there floating these bonds around and playing this silly uh, Monopoly game with, uh, you know, a Dan Peterson and a Leroy Schweitzer, Rod Skirdal, you know, just like Park Place and Broadway and all, all of those little 
deals and then they start trading that stuff around, you know? Yeah. All derivatives. And when you start studying all of this banking stuff, you know, you know, and it's all coming right out of the uniform commercial state laws, which is uh, the uniform commercial code is a part of it because they have the uniform securities act, they have the uniform drivers act, they have the uniform divorce act, they have over 300 of them, and they're all coming out of the think tank in Chicago. And uh, their goal is, and this is through the American Bar Association, that every state, county, and, and federal will be on the same level. But they're not. They, they made so many laws that they, or rules or regulations, whatever you want to call them, I call them junk, but uh, they, they made so many, and they're just playing a big game, you know, so you can take and read the rules and then somebody got to decipher what they are. And that's why the old cliche that takes a Philadelphia lawyer to figure this out. I'm, I was a self-taught mechanic, so I became a self-taught reader of the book and, and decided that I, I had enough of these attorneys. Yeah, it's becoming well-known knowledge now that um, just about every document or promise or obligation that's created, a court case, a driver's license, birth certificate, almost any kind of engagement with the uh, official world uh, in commerce is turned into a bond. As you said, they're floating these bonds around, they create these things. They, they float them out on the market, they, they get leveraged many times over, and it just creates a huge business that people don't even know about that's going on in the background. So just by creating a case number, they can make millions of dollars by throwing you into prison. They make money off of throwing you into prison. Um, that's a whole nother thing uh, when you get prisoner's number. And so just to summarize what you guys were doing, you were uncovering uh, fraud, ultra various acts, um, illegal operations, and making claims against those people. And from what I understand is, is you were giving them uh, notice and grace to correct those things, acting in good faith. And then when they fail to do so, then that, uh, that claim becomes perfected, right? That's, that's the way it reads. That's what it says in the bank officer's handbook. That's exactly how you do it. And then when you find out that the court is a bank and they're creating all of these uh, default judgments and when there's a default, then they deposit it in a bank and uh, they, got, they got quite a scam going. And it's still going to this day. And so if a, if a claim is an accounts receivable, an accounts receivable is basically commercial paper which has value. And uh, uh, Leroy and you guys then uh, figured that out from the bank officer's handbook. And uh, tell us about uh, taking that, that first uh, claim down to the bank and, and making a deposit. Well, before we made any deposit, what we did, Mark, we took uh, Leroy and I, and anyway, we studied this, and he says, I'm going to try this. And here's what he did. That's when stamps were 29 cents. So he ordered two rolls of postage stamps. With, there's 100 to a roll. It was $58. So he takes and makes out one of his liens, awards, or whatever they wanted to call them. What we did, he took and married, he sent this to Mary Cowan, who was the postmaster at Brusette, Montana. And she didn't know what to do with it, so she took and sent it to Great Falls to the U.S. Postal Inspector. The U.S. Postal Inspector, in about 10 days, took and sent Leroy two rolls of postage stamps. Now, they must have checked this out to see if it was valid or not. They sent this two rolls of postage stamps, and they were in an envelope, but they had taken and used MT, the abbreviation for Montana, and a zip code. So Leroy says, we're not opening these. But you could hold it up to the light and you could see that it was two rolls of postage stamps. This was our evidence that was valid. Okay. So we, got chosen, we got charged with postal fraud. Now, my question is, if there was postal fraud, wouldn't have that happen from the postal inspector by taking and sending two rolls of postage stamps? Or was it in traffic? 
it has to be one or the other. Uh huh. Yeah. And I feel it was. I feel that it was. It was valid, and the reason is, is because then after Leroy and I got kidnapped, we were taken down to Wichita, Kansas, to testify in a court case with Leroy Greathouse, and the attorney down there was his name was Kurt Kearns. Anyway, he came up and talked to us, and we agreed to go down and testify in that court. That was before they had our court. And I never ever got to testify, but Leroy did. And Leroy told me on the way coming back in the plane, they flew us down in a U.S. Marshal plane. He said, after about 10 minutes of testimony, he said the uh, jury foreman got up and said, this man is innocent. And the judge slammed the gavel down and then sealed the case so we couldn't use it here in Billings. Oh, my goodness. Well, see, this is justice. Yeah. And uh, it was either valid or it's invalid. Evidently, it must have been valid. Because the guy, we paid off his farm and bought him a new 1996 Ford pickup. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and then, then they say that, uh, that we're out there creating our own money. No, we're not creating any money. It's all a credit debit system. It's a bookkeeping entry. People better to learn what's going on with the bank. Didn't Leroy take one of your claims, uh, a.k.a. liens, down to the bank in Helena and make a deposit and open up a checking account? Well, no, he done that in, in Butte. Oh, Butte, okay. Tell us about that. Uh, well, okay. He didn't do it. A guy by the name of Warren Stone, who was a college professor, he was an English professor in Bozeman, in uh, Montana State College. And anyway, uh, him and Leroy were working together when Leroy lived in Bozeman. And uh, Leroy had sued the city of Belgrade in Gallatin County. And he opened the case in federal court in Butte, Montana. And there was a guy by the name of Paul Hatfield. We called him Panama Paul, and I'll, I'll tell you about that here in a little bit. But Warren Strong went over to Butte to open this case, and he put a $100 Federal Reserve note on the table, and with, along with the paperwork, because that was the filing fee. And the clerk kept yelling and screaming, and he just turned around and walked out. Well, then Panama Paul made judicial determination that Leroy was trying to make a deposit in court. Yes, that's what you're doing when you open up a case. You're making a deposit in court. So Panama Paul then ordered the clerk of the court to open up his savings account at Norwest Bank in Butte, Montana under Leroy Schweitzer's name. And it was put into a savings account and they were taking and paying interest on the savings account, on this hundred dollars. Well, Leroy, then uh, in the bank officer's handbook, it says you have to have a place to deposit your accounts receivable. Leroy had one. So, after a little while, then Panama Paul, he tried to dismiss the case for failure to prosecute. And again, Leroy was asking the public officials to open their bond, and they weren't producing. But uh, there was a, this account open, so then Leroy took and sued Panama Paul for $777,777.77. <laughs> you understand the seven, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. So he deposited that in in the accounts receivable that Panama Hall had opened up. That was when it really started getting wild. So just to, just to slow down, uh, hold on that point, so the accounts receivable then, just for clarity of the record, if I understand correctly, was an affidavit of obligation that was agreed to by acquiescence from the parties against whom the affidavit was placed. Would that be correct? I would say that it's right on. Okay. Because, 
See, they have defaulted when they, and see, this is where a foreclosure starts in the bank officer's handbook. If they default, then the bank can start a foreclosure process. Okay, so after I had sued the county commissioners and all of these people over the crap that they pulled on me in Petroleum County, it came to six hundred million three hundred thousand. So I but I didn't have an account, but Leroy did. So what I did, I used the UCC three, which is an addendum to a UCC one, and uh, it can be used for several different things, but one of the things is it can be used for a partial assignment. So I just assigned my portion over to Leroy and had him deposit it. Because we didn't know how much was in there. Like like Leroy said, he said the banks are they're they're the ones they're the bookkeepers, they they'll keep track of all of this. You know, we just made a laugh and joke out of it, and they, they did. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, then this Derek Spates, who was an FBI agent out of uh, Hawaii, he came over and met with us. At, my wife came down here to Billings and picked him up and then took him up to Rod's home in the Bull Mountains where we were. And, and anyway, uh, this Derek Spates gets on his telephone and calls Bruce Parker, who was the president of Norwest Bank, and wanted to know what the standings was on on uh, Leroy Schleicher's account with Norwest Bank, and, and Bruce Parker says that is no longer here. It ha and State says where was where is it now? And he says it was turned over to the United States Treasury. The accounts receivable, the affidavit, the paperwork supporting the accounts receivable. That's right. The, which is basically a debt instrument. That's right. Yeah, commercial paper. It's commercial paper. Mm -hmm. And getting back to this Panama Paul, the reason we call him that was he used to be, uh, he was either a senator or representative for the feds out of uh, Montana here in Congress. And he finally got voted out there, and then they came along because he was an attorney and appointed him as a, a U.S. district judge. And uh, but he, uh, Panama Paul was the one that gave the swing vote that gave away the Panama Canal to the Chinese. Oh, okay. Now getting back to Northwest Bank, we searched and searched and searched for their. Uh, articles of a corporation to do business in Montana and which is a requirement according to the Montana codes and uh, they were on file with the Secretary of State researched in Washington, Idaho and we finally found them in Minnesota and guess who the major stockholder of Norwest Bank was? Who? The People's Republic of China. Oh my goodness. Okay, so now Panama Paul, he, does, he just done them a big favor, you know, uh, taking and opening up this bank account. But see then, Norwest Bank, then now they went out of business, and guess who accepted their, all of their uh, liabilities? The Treasury. Fargo Bank. Oh. No, Wells Fargo. Okay. Wells Fargo. Now look at the big deal that they just got caught with their hands in the cookie jar opening up all of these accounts and, uh, for people and people didn't even know that there was accounts open for them. Free money. This is how corrupt. Yeah. That's how, that's how come we're in such a, they keep saying that we're a hundred trillion in debt. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're, they're, they're not balancing the books. They're cooking the books. They just they're not balancing. They want to hang that obligation over the people. That's right. As a control mechanism. So back to Norwest Bank. So you deposited this accounts receivable and were writing checks against it, right? The bank had issued a checkbook and you were writing checks against that. Is that correct? Well, we were, they weren't called checks. They were called uh, lane drafts and, and warrants. And, yeah. Uh, 
they had a whole list of names that you could take and call them, and then Leroy would take and change them from time to time. Oh, okay. And, uh, and the reason that we know they work is Bill Stanton, one of my co-defendants from up in the Doozette area, he had a Merrill Lynch cash management account, and Leroy gave him something like three and a half million, and he deposited in the Merrill Lynch account. Merrill Lynch, Bill, he had, he had a 800 number that he could call, and we recorded every uh, conversation or every time he had called in, and he had something like $1,200 in this account. And then when he called in, it, it said there was uh, three million, I'm gonna use 500, because I, I don't know the exact number. Yeah, huge one. And uh, $1,012 or something like this in there. But they said your spendable was only $1,012. Well, so then two weeks passed, and it was on a Friday, and it said your cash manager account is three million five hundred and one thousand twelve dollars. Your spendable account is three million five hundred thousand. Whatever the numbers was, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, right? yeah, several million as opposed to one thousand. It was saying that it had cleared <laughs> because before, you know, okay, so they must have checked it out. Wouldn't they check it out before they had said it had cleared? Sure, yeah, and pay on right. it. So then, so then the next move was we took and had Agnes Stanton, who was Bill's wife, my wife, Sherilyn, and uh, a woman by the name of Ann Cramlick, who was a notary, or notary public, and they came down to Billings and went to Costco and bought a whole bunch of stuff and uh, office supplies and whatnot like that. Went to Albertsons, I think at the time it was Butteries, and bought a whole bunch of groceries. And, and then they stopped at the first interstate bank and bought two $10,000 cashier checks. And you, they cleared. Okay, using what? What did they use as uh, an instrument to make the purchase? The credit that was set in that Merrill Lynch cash management account. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. He had done said that there was there was funds in there to spend anyway. This woman took and wrote out these two ten thousand dollar cashier checks, and uh, she never even called Merrill Lynch to find out if it was valid or not. She said, "We know them," and, and uh, anyway, she wrote the cashier <laughs> checks. Oh my goodness. Now, now they turned around and they were charging us with bank fraud. Who in the hell's got bank fraud? There was her. The woman that took and wrote out the check. And when you take and read the law, and that's what it says. It doesn't say the one that issued. You know, it's the one that issued the check. Well, she issued the certified check. Uh -huh. we, didn't have, we didn't have no way to certify it. Yeah, they had every opportunity to verify the availability of funds. See, the, the thing of it is, is we were, we were following their law and had broke and figured it out and they didn't like it because we were playing in their sandbox. Yeah, you weren't, you weren't authorized to use the same laws that they do. That's right. Mm. But, you know, it explained it in great detail and now, uh, all of, after all of these years and whatnot, there's more of this stuff that is starting to surface. Everything that we had done was right on target. But yeah. we was just like about 20 years ahead of time, and uh, we got slapped around for it. You know, I hope nobody else uh, tries it, but the thing is, is we got to understand there is no funds. You don't own anything. You're just in possession of it. Everything is and, credit. Exactly. And so, you know, and... I've heard the old cliche of possession is nine tenths of the law, but I never get asked, where's that other tenth? Well, I finally found out that other tenth is owned by the corporation. It's called the United States Federal Corporation and the State of Montana Corporation and Billings City Corporation and Yellowstone County Corporation. You know, everything is a corporation. So back to the, the definition of money, which kind of you started the whole conversation out on that, is just to make clear for people listening that 
Money, the medium of exchange, which we call money today, is nothing more than credit, and that credit emanates or comes from debt. And so when you create debt or a legitimate debt instrument, you can then issue credit against that, and that's money. And that's exactly, that's what you did. You created the debt obligation by way of the affidavits of obligation. Some people call it a commercial lien. You created that obligation. It was perfected according to the bank officer's handbook. And uh, the bankers accepted that. The funds cleared. And it was being used. That's right. Yeah. let's take a closer look at these lien drafts, aka comptroller warrants, what the media were calling bogus checks. This one in particular was written out to myself and Chief Justice of District Court in Jefferson County, Colorado. At the time, uh, this particular judge, the Chief Justice, was basically the hangman judge. All political cases would go there and he would dispose of them in a manner that was in accordance with the desires of the political class. Okay, so that was interesting. In any event, there was a parallel case going on in the common law court venue in our one Supreme Court of the county of by and for the people. And that court is the court of original jurisdiction for a person of my legal status. That being the case, the common law court had issued a letter rogatory to the district court, basically informing them that the case was being removed to the court of original jurisdiction. And that being the case, Leroy drew up this check as a supersedis bond for that purpose to myself and Chief Justice Perricone. So let's take a closer look at it. As we can see, this draft is drawn upon the treasurer of the United States of America, and that is spelled with a small u, thus rendering the word united as a descriptive adjective, not a part of the pronoun. So right off the bat, you can see that Leroy was operating purely in the de jure law, at law with the de jure Republic of the United States, forcing the treasurer of the United States to put on his hat as treasurer for the Republic of the United States of America. Okay, And we see here that this draft is redeemable at the office of the postmaster. The postmaster controls all commerce. People don't realize how powerful the postmaster is. The postmaster is in charge of commerce. In fact, you could take any case involving mail fraud to the Universal Postal Union in Bern, Switzerland, and they would resolve the matter in the event that a party was using the mail for fraud, i.e. any government agency, any individual, any company, they would shut that group down immediately in commerce. So the postmaster is extremely powerful. And we know from previous experience, as you heard Dan recount, that the postmaster had previously verified the validity of these documents by sending two rolls of stamps in exchange for one of these very lien drafts. Okay, so the way this is created is that this instrument is payable on site by the postmaster for and on behalf of the treasurer of the United States. Right now, Leroy wrote in here this is a special bond, a supersedious bond, and a supersedious bond is basically an appeal bond, which is a type of surety bond that a court requires from an appellant who wants to delay payment of a judgment until the appeal is over. In this case, the one Supreme Court of the county was drawing the case into its venue from the district court and was bonding that action with this lien draft for $1 million. Okay, now we can see the remitter, very clear. No one's hiding here, out in the open. It's Leroy Schweitzer. And the drawer, the maker is against, or as the drawer and the maker, and this is drawn against the special account in the U.S. Treasury, whereby the accounts receivable had now been held. Remember, Dan said that the 
the feds came took the accounts receivable out of norwest bank and now the treasury was the holder in due course on the instrument therefore as the holder in due course they would then be responsible for managing claims against that asset and that's exactly what this lien draft is okay and this particular instrument is drawn against a very specific lien which has its own number so it's very specific as to who the holder in due course is who the remitter is for the instrument Leroy's not hiding from anything his name is out there in the open as the drawer and the maker of the instrument and it's being written against the assets the credits created by lien number such and such all right very clear out in the open based on established fact and experience all right so let's look at the signature side we can see that Leroy signs as the issuer or the maker of the instrument and he also signs as the endorser for the endorsement accepting the instrument and so what that basically does is makes this a bearer instrument so that anybody with this instrument it's already been endorsed and he does that as an accommodation signature which is allowed in the UCC we'll see in just a minute all right so anybody with this instrument can simply present it as a bearer instrument for payment of cash or other agreed upon specie of payment all right so in the first signature he signs as the issuer or the maker of the instrument the second signature he signs as the acceptor an acceptance signature which is the endorsement okay so let's look at that text goes with the second signature it's included in the second signature he says without recourse UCC 3-415 UCC 3-415 talks about uh, if an instrument is dishonored an endorser is obligated to pay the amount due on the instrument according to the terms of the instrument now in paragraph B it says if it states that it is made without recourse or otherwise disclaims liability of the endorser the endorser is not liable under subsection A to pay the instrument okay so what is he doing here usually in most every case it's the issuer the maker of the instrument that is the one who is liable for it ultimately if for some reason the instrument is dishonored then the person who is to accept that instrument goes back to the issuer or the maker right so he's not taking liability in both capacities he's taking liability as the issuer or the maker but not as the acceptor because he is providing an accommodation signature as the acceptor so let's look at that under the uniform commercial code instruments signed for accommodation paragraph a if an instrument is issued for value given for benefit of a party to the instrument the person uh, to whom it's made out to who is the accommodated party and another party to the instrument who is the accommodation party in this case Leroy signs the instrument for purposes of incurring liability on the instrument without being a direct beneficiary which he's not he made it out to somebody else given for the instrument the instrument is signed by the accommodation party for accommodation okay simply as an accommodation to assist in streamlining the the negotiation of the instrument okay so he's basically made it a bearer instrument in this case and uh, he signs as the issuer and the maker where the liability stays and then he signs as the accommodation signature where he does not accept the liability in that capacity because he's already accepted it as the maker now it's very clear that his name is on there as the issuer the authorized acceptance signature he indicates that he is the surety and the guarantor of this instrument he'll back it up his name is on it and there's a maxim in law that basically states that without risk there is no authority in other words if you don't put your name to something you don't have any authority you know that document has no authority that's why we use the notary to verify and authenticate a person's signature so that that document has true authority all right it's a verification of the authority when you use a notary so 
Leroy's name is all over this, accepting full liability and responsibility for it. He's out in the open. Tell me, what's bogus about that? It has 100% full faith and credit of the United States Treasurer and Leroy Schweitzer. Is that a bogus check? I don't think so. I want to find out who in the United States of America have I damaged with conspiracy, bank fraud, and, and uh, they've got down mail fraud and false claims, interstate transportation of stolen property, and threats federal officials and <laughs> failing communication. And then the Hobbs Act and the Aaron Gert, the crime of death, the violence in the phone. You know. Wow. You must be a pretty bad dude. I am. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you just keep racking them up one after the other. Holy cow. And the big biz, I'm reading this right off of uh, the judgment and commit order. And uh, it has my resident. A defendant's resident at that address, Yellowstone County Detention Center. <laughs> I wasn't there as a resident. Yeah, it makes it sound like it's willful, and that's where you've decided to uh, set up your domicile. Yeah, and then they have my social security number, or they use this social security number, 472-60-7021, which is out of Minnesota. I never ever lived in Minnesota. Montana precursor numbers for social security numbers five one six or five one seven. Okay. So they wrote up what is uh, called a pre sentence investigation report and they use somebody else's social security number because I would not cooperate and they had to get me in prison some way. So then when I started asking for uh, the judgment and committal order and I said this is not my social security number uh, and I I questioned them about it and they just said well that's the number that's down well you got a problem with the court so then I went to address the court and they would ignore it and this was John C. Kuhnhauer out of the Western District of Washington because all of the judges in Montana have recused themselves and uh, they had brought in uh, James Burns out of Oregon to begin with, and then James Burns, he got to looking at this, and he was an old constitutional lawyer. He finally called uh, the one that originally, I evidently lodged the complaint was Nick Murphy, yeah, who was county attorney in uh, Garfield County, but. Uh, Mr. Burns called him or Judge Burns, whatever you want to call him. But anyway, he said, uh, your case doesn't mean, or meet must, or I think the case ought to be dismissed. And they removed him, and then they put uh, John T. Kuhnhoff on. And I don't have the documentation, but safe was made to... Uh, the attorneys that he said we won't because we spent over a hundred million on the standoff in Jordan, Montana. Well, that wasn't my fault. <laughs> hundred million. That's so ridiculous. So ridiculous. How do you spend that kind of money? My goodness gracious. Well, they did, and then they walked off, and they hung a bunch of the people over there. You can. You know, this is hearsay, but uh, I've been told that there were some of the people that had motels and cafes and, and uh, service stations and whatnot that got left hanging. The honest United States of America Corporation people walked out without paying their bill. Oh, jeez. You know, that's it's, the, uh, it's indicative of who you're dealing with. Well, the thing of it is, is I would be a liar if I said and said that I'm perfect. But I'm going to tell you what, I've always tried to be honest, and especially with myself, because I do believe what Christ Jesus said. He said, 
the two most important commandments are love your God with all your heart and with all your mind, all your soul. And the second one is, is love your neighbors the way you want to be loved. And that's all I'm looking for. I just want somebody to stand up to the plate and say, no, this isn't right. We've got all of these people that portray to be Christians, and they're not. Right. And it's, it's a sad state of affairs. In name only. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and everybody that does run for office and try to go in and do a good job, I don't know what kind of a deal they got hanging over their head, but I've heard some pretty um, weird and vicious things, you know, and, uh, and I'm sure that that's probably true, but I, I can't even talk about it because it's not me to judge. But yeah. Remember, one of these days, there is going to be a judgment day. I'm 75 years old, and I will not quit looking for the truth. And I hope that all of the government officials that take and listen to what I'm saying right now understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Because not only is uh, your audience uh, a lot of good people that are desperate and looking the truth just like I and the others were, but we're all searching for the truth. And we have been ever since any time. Truth becomes the enemy, and people like ourselves who seek the truth are quickly labeled as terrorists. Why? Because those in power are terrified of the truth being brought forward. That's yeah, totally correct. Totally. <laughs> so, uh, so what they're saying really is true from their perspective, but not from ours. Well, so. the thing is, is, is they, they go to church... And I don't know what church they belong to, but I've always tried to be fair in my heart and in my mind. And this was one of Leroy's uh, biggest things. Uh, he said, you know, we've got to be honest with each other or we're not going to get any place. So we were just a group of men, like-minded men. And when you read the Bible, it says, uh, God has labeled us as a peculiar, a select, and a elect group of people, his people. We know that the planet Earth is being run by Satan, but uh, it's our duty and obligation to get back on track and, and get back to God, either that or throw that thing out the window. I, and, I, you know, all the time I was in prison, I had, I had uh, some of the guards and, and different people saying, why are you here? Why are you here? Well, just because I, I think different than everybody else, and I act different. Yeah. But Peculiar I'm people. Not, I'm not trying to do it for sympathy or anything like that. I just want truth. Yeah. And uh, I think in John 8.32 it says, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. It doesn't say it'll set you free. It just says it'll make you free. And, and I feel good about what I'm doing. And I feel good in, in talking to you, Mark, just because at least somebody wants to listen to this. Uh, well, I'm sure we could go on and on and on, but uh, I think we hit the high points. And uh, I think this is really going to help people understand quite a bit, not only about your story, but uh, but also about the law and uh, and government, and that's you know that's even the bigger issue. So uh, so I think we're killing a few birds with one stone here. So I really appreciate that. Well, see, Mark, this is one of the things I learned from Leroy Spicer and Rod Skirdal when I first met. Him. They said, "Don't believe a word we tell you. Here's where we found it. Yep. Read it for yourself." So that's what I started doing. I didn't rely on them. I, I started using my own mind. Sure. And it, it just, well, it was so overwhelming. It's just indescribable of what is really going on.
Christ Jesus, that's the reason they crucified him was because he did, turned over the tables in, in the temple to the money changers and said, you won't do that in, in my father's house. Well, that's been good enough for me. But uh, they crucified us. They didn't kill us like they did him. But, uh, uh, you know, and it, it all hinges on, on knowledge. But they don't like anybody that knows anything and, and can put two and two together. But they take everything totally out of context. So when you're taking and reading something, you've you got to go get their books and you got to figure out what they're talking about. Yeah, bottom line, they operate in a completely different world. Uh, it's a figment of imagination, it's fiction, it's deception, it's artifice, and we go into court thinking, well, logic, common sense, common law, where's the damage, and uh, the two just don't mix, and that's that's why you know people are just getting trampled right and left, We're operating in different worlds and different understandings, different languages. They get away with it because of our lack of understanding. So hopefully, hopefully. Uh, our discussion will, will elucidate these issues for people and uh, get them on track at least with a little bit more understanding. You know, I really think that covered a lot of good ground. Covered a lot of ground, so I really appreciate your time and, and input. Okay, well, I'll let you go and get on with your day, but thank you very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you, and I'm really excited about sharing this information with the world and uh, fighting for freedom, continuing the battle. Well, God bless you, and and, uh, and I thank you for for your concern. It's uh, it's a pleasure to to talk to somebody that knows how to make contact with the outside world, and I appreciate it. Well, good. Okay, well then, take care. God bless. You bet. All right. Bye bye. So there you have it, straight from the horse's mouth. Folks, if you appreciate this kind of work, there's an awful lot that's gone into producing not only this video, but everything that we've brought to you at no cost here in our YouTube channel. If you'd like to support us, please get my books and workshops to continue expanding your knowledge base and education. I invite you to visit OneFreeMansWar.com. You can do that in a manner that's a la carte. And once you get really serious, then I would invite you to join us in the Lighthouse Log Club. With that, I will bid you adieu and take care and God bless.